So hi guys, uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Powell Kaputa from University of Warsaw, Poland in our QASTM seminar series. This is the 85th seminar in the series. Um, uh, he'll go, going to speak about path integral optimization from conformal field theories, its application to ADS. And uh, this is the topic on which he's working from last two, three years. And uh, I can say he's the, one of the experts in this pioneering field. And uh, we are very hopeful to uh, learn a lot of things from him on this talk. And thank you, Powell, for ha uh, having you in this uh, seminar series and agreeing to give this talk. And uh, I believe that will be helpful to all of us. So you can start. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a great pleasure uh, to give a talk here. Thank you for the invitation. Sorry for this uh, slow communication during the pandemic, but I hope now it's going to be smooth. So uh, can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah, I guess it should be visible. OK, good. So indeed, maybe I, uh, I'll be talking about the path integral optimization from CFE to ADS, or more uh, maybe a bit more on the recent work on holographic path integral optimization. And uh, uh, since I was giving a bit more time, I'll try to uh, give a longer introduction to some basic tools <clears throat> that we have been using in this program. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, the, pro the idea of extracting holographic geometry from CFTs using path in the procedure called path integral optimization. And then the second part of my talk will be based on, on these recent works on path integral optimization uh, from hard to Hawking wave functions. And finally, I'll conclude and post some open questions. So please stop me at any moment. Uh, I, I heard it's supposed to be very relaxed and very interactive. So feel free to ask questions at any time. Uh, and, and as I was saying, sorry, by the way, can you see my whole screen? Yes. OK, because I, I'm just somehow like the pictures of, of participants cover some parts, but maybe you don't see them. OK, so this is based on, on uh, oh, somehow I see like the slide here is a bit older. <laughs> so the, this is going to be based on, uh, on the paper that already appeared with uh, my student Jan Boruch and uh, my postdoc Dong Shenge and Tadashi Takayanagi, and also earlier paper from uh, late last year with Jan and Tadashi, as well as um, uh, some works that are already Maybe five years, uh, no, four years, well, uh, some, somewhere from 2017 with, uh, with the group in Kyoto that I used to be a member of with uh, Nilai Kundu, Masamichi Miyagi, and Kento Watanabe, and Tadashi Taken. Okay, so in the introduction part, I will first, uh, before I actually go to the main introduction uh, to my talk, I will uh, I'll do an introduction to the introduction. So I'll, I'll uh, review some basic uh, facts about uh, tools that I'm going to be using in my talk, uh, or tools that, are, that, my, that the most of my works are based on, namely the, the relation between path integrals and states, and then the computation of Jacobian and CFTs that is very important for our path integral optimization work. And finally, I'll remind you what, some basic facts about hard to Hawking wave functions and, and also complexity. Uh, and its relation to tensor networks. So basically, these four topics will play an important role in the second part, in the main part of my talk. Good. So, um, so maybe I'll move the speakers. Okay. Let me start from uh, something very basic that you probably all are familiar, namely um, the relation um, between the tool of path integral and uh, uh, and how we define and how we can use it to compute uh, wave functions in quantum field theories, of course, quant in quantum mechanics and quantum field theories. And what I will review is just some basic material that you can find in Polchinski. So uh, let's here consider a free scalar theory given by this uh, variable x that satisfies the usual equations of motion, namely the box x equals to zero. And then uh, when we compute uh, 
when we're usually when we're interested in the state or partial uh, particular wave function, say the vacuum wave functions for this theory, we can compute it by the path integral on a disk. So basically we take the disk geometry and at the boundary of the disk at the uh, absolute value of z equals to one, we impose some boundary conditions for this, uh, for this scalar field uh, X. In my example, it's gonna be some expansion of, uh, of the field in the modes. So these are the modes uh, that for reality, uh, Xn uh, star should be the complex conjugate of Xn, Xn should be X minus N. And then we define the wave function, which actually in quantum field theory is a functional of this boundary condition as simply the, path, the Euclidean path integral. So we take the Euclidean action for this free scalar and we define this Euclidean, the wave functional as the Euclidean uh, path in, Feynman path integral with the prescribed boundary condition that at uh, the radius, if I, we parameterize this uh, complex coordinate by the radius and some complex phase, then at the radius equal to one, um, then uh, the, uh, the boundary condition is given by our boundary condition then the wave functional uh, exactly is defined by, uh, by this uh, Euclidean Feynman path integral. And then to evaluate it. Um, oh, uh, yes. So here Z, the complex variable is e to the power i theta. Uh, you have chosen like that. Thanks. So I, yeah, sorry, I should have written it. Z is R, the variable R times e to the i theta. Yeah, but R you have chosen to be one. Uh, no, no, sorry. So at, uh, so at R equals one, I'm imposing the boundary condition. Uh, okay, 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 thank, okay. Thank you, thank you. This is important. So, so basically I'm, I'm parameterizing this disk by the coordinate R from zero to one. And then oh. uh, the angular direction theta. And then I'm imposing the boundary condition at R equals to one, such that the, the fields, the, the scalar field at R equals to one should be equal to my boundary condition. Okay, my second question is why specifically Euclidean path integral, why not Lorentzian? Uh, so, so the wave functions in standard quantum field theory are defined this way. They are defined as some Euclidean evolution or as the Euclidean path integrals. In the Lorentzian oh. signature, it will actually also become important uh, in the moment or in the later part of my talk. We are more thinking about transition amplitudes as you know in quantum mechanics and not just states. Okay, okay. Great, thanks a lot. These are, these are great questions. So one, so one question is like, why specifically less than equals to one, z? z? Oh, so th this, I'm just choosing this to be my geometry, okay? So this is like the interior of the disk. Okay, sir. This, this is where my field theory will live and then I will, uh, I will define the state uh, in the vacuum of this free scalar uh, as a, basically this path integral on this geometry with the boundary condition as follows, okay? So this, okay. Is, this is my setup. This is the definition of the vacuum in a, in a, in a free scalar theory on the disk, in the free scalar on the disk or in free scalar in with the finite side, in the finite on the circle. Okay, good. So basically then we can evaluate this path integral explicitly. And for that, we take, uh, basically we, as you, as you probably remember from quantum mechanics, we decompose this uh, uh, quantum field X as some classical uh, X that satisfies the equations of motion. And then, uh, and uh, also uh, class satisfies the boundary condition so that uh, this classical X at r equals to one should be exactly reproducing our boundary condition, and at uh, x prime uh, and 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 also some quantum x prime over which I will do the path integral, uh, and this x prime the quantum x prime has the boundary condition such that it vanishes at zero. So so the the, the whole quantum uh, the quantum field x has the right boundary condition. Okay, so. So let's do it explicitly. So once we do this, then uh, we can see the wave the computation of wave functions separates into the contribution from the classical uh, part of uh, the uh, of the field X. So basically, this is this overall exponent of a classical value of the action. This is the Euclidean action on on X B and some quantum part with this quantum boundary condition that X prime vanishes at zero over all the X prime one minus blah blah. blah. And 
and this actually uh, so uh, this thing uh, as you can see this this quantum part it is going to just give you the overall phase so it will be some normalization of the wave function simply because it does not depend on the boundary condition xb that we uh, that we imposed from the start and then uh, basically the all the all dependence all in some sense important dependence on this boundary condition is captured by this classical uh, action evaluated on this particular boundary condition so in our example once we put this uh, boundary condition uh, you know we do this integral over the disk and that reproduces for us the standard answer for the free scalar so it's like one over alpha prime sum over all the modes n x n x minus n so in some sense uh, in fact in in uh, up to the normalization which is basically this some computation of this quantum determinant we get the wave function that is just what you expect from you know classical from quantum mechanics or from the free scalar field theory for the vacuum, which is just the product over all the modes with the weight n. Again, this is maybe a, a standard computation from Polchinski's book, but you, if you haven't seen that, I, I wanted to um, I wanted to uh, review it for you. And basically, uh, for the rest of part of my talk, uh, the somehow interesting. Like I will be, I will somehow not be interested in this classical part in this talk. But we'll be when we will be talking about path integral optimization. Uh, it's actually. It's actually going to be this quantum part uh, or this determinant part that, that in some sense it's connected to geometry and that will be important. Okay, so are there any questions about this? Good. If not, then uh, I'm going to move to the second part. And the second part is actually computation of this Jacobian. So this is actually related to this part. Um, and uh, again, this is some very well known thing from already the 80s, but let me let me review it maybe uh, in, in a slightly non-standard signature, namely the Lorentzian signature. Um, so basically, um, the question is um, how uh, the question is somehow uh, that we are interested in uh, that we would be interested in in the second part of my talk will be the transformation of the path integral measure once we uh, do the vial rescaling. So in general, uh, let's say that I'll, in, from, from now on in this slide, I'll be interested in, you, uh, in, in again, the path integral in, in say this free scalar theory, but uh, a transformation of this path integral uh, under, this, uh, under this basically vial rescaling of the uh, usual Lorentzian metric. So here I'm taking some, uh, some vial factor uh, phi that depends on both position and the time coordinate of the metric. And then this is the Lorentzian metric on, uh, on the 2D plane, this for simplicity. And, uh, and then uh, basically the, scale, the Ricci scalar of this metric is given as follows. And we will be interested in the question um, how, uh, so how the measure of the path integral, yes? Basically, you have written the metric in a conformally flat form. Very good. Yes. Yes. So similar thing also people can do for d -seater as well. So for d -seater, can anybody apply this kind of procedure as well? Uh, you mean like the path integral optimization procedure? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I, this is a good question. Uh, I will can talk about it at the end. That's, that's actually, you are going very fast ahead, but that's important. Great. So uh, basically, we take the. We'll be interested in a question: uh, how the measure of the path integral transforms under this uh, vial rescaling. And actually, this is the standard derivation due to Polyakov. So basically, generally, we take that the measure of the path integral, the scalarly phi, are all the quantum fields that you have. Uh, and this is some general denote by general. We denote all the quantum fields by the scalarly phi. And, and basically, uh, we postulate that uh, the measure of the path integral in, the, uh, in this vial rescale geometry, vial flat geometry, is related to the measure of the path integral in the flat geometry by some determinant j, where basically j is this formal transformation between the metric g, which is the full metric, vial times eta, over the eta. So uh, basically formally uh, using the functional, uh, this is of course the functional derivative. We can write it basically this derivative as uh, uh, with this x and x prime as exponent of this vial factor 
uh, times the two-dimensional delta function, where here by x, I mean both x and t. Sorry for that. OK, and then uh, basically we can compute uh, we can compute this determinant as effect as basically exponent of some effective action that will depend on this phi and eta. And, and in some sense, this equation is the de definition of this effective action or definition of this determinant. So let me uh, let me show you exactly how this goes. Basically, we use the, the standard identity that you remember from also maybe quantum mechanics that when you uh, when we take the, the, uh, the variation of this effective action with respect to phi, uh, then we can use the formula for the variation of the log of the determinant, which is nothing but the variation of the trace of the log of j. And if we use this formal definition, that basically that basically boils down to the, to the equation that the, the variation of this effective action is two times the integral over the plane over this delta function, this two-dimensional delta function here at zero. The zero comes from the fact that we had to take the trace in setting x to x prime, and then times d phi x. And then basically we compute, uh, the, uh, the logic is that we compute this variation first. So in, we have to define this delta function in some way, and then we integrate this action back to get the full action, the full functional dependence on this phi. So, um, Basically, how do we do that is by, for example, by regularization using the heat kernel. So we can define this two-dimensional delta function as basically uh, the coincident limit of this uh, heat kernel, K. Okay. It's not gonna be important uh, what exactly it is. The important thing is that it's actually universal and geometric and can be written as basically in any metric G can be written as I times the square root of G. There's like one over epsilon factor. This comes from the UV regularization. And then there's a standard answer proportional to the Ricci scalar of this metric. So in other words, if we plug it back, then the variation of this effective action proportional to delta phi is this divergent piece. Uh, and now this square root of G, we rewrite it as basically square root of eta times the Weyl factor. So actually this divergent piece becomes the potential then there's also the kinetic term, and there's also uh, the general. This is more general answer. If we have if we have chosen some curved background uh, instead of the file flat form, so we can write this action generally like this. And then if we integrate this action, we derive the standard. Uh, so so this is exactly the formula from the previous uh, page. If we integrate now uh, over phi, we get the standard. Uh, well, we get, we get basically the kinetic term for the scalar and also the potential. And then we usually rescale this action plus some order epsilon terms from the heat kernel. And then we can usually rescale this action to get the, uh, the canonically normalized kinetic term and also absorb this, uh, this uh, normalization uh, into the potential by a constant shift. And that gives us the standard uh, Liouville action in two dimensions. So this is something that you are probably familiar from your string theory or 2D CFT course that uh, basically this effective action in two dimensions is nothing but the integral over the anomaly with the regulator uh, potential term of the Liouville field that comes from this regulator one over epsilon. I wanted to review it for you, even though it's some standard textbook material, because this will actually be important in my talk. And in the first part of the talk, I will use the Euclidean version of this. So everything what I said here could have been done in the Euclidean signature. But actually for the second part of my talk, the, uh, it is important to know that this, these formulas can also be done in uh, Lorentzian signature. And even for the last part of my talk, as Shannon already noticed, one can also do similar things for the Sitter space and one can also do, uh, uh, well, the, the, these types of actions will be important in the case of uh, the Sitter space time as well, like the reference the Sitter space. Okay, so that was the part number two. Are there any questions about this? Okay, seems like not. I mean, these are some, uh, just some basic materials before I start my talks. So I hope, uh, uh, I hope uh, you know. For I, I'm not going too slow for those of you that are familiar with that. But in case you haven't heard that, this might be useful. Actually, let me also maybe uh, uh, stress one more point. So, so in the usual, because here, uh, here uh, I define this transformation of the measure of the path integral as basically by this effective action, and I was arguing that this effective action is given by the Liouville action. 
But actually, to be more precise, um, what you might usually find in the literature is that uh, we are interested in the action where uh, that is invariant under the symmetries uh, of, of this background metric that we started with. So in other words, uh, as you can see this metric here, this metric G hat, that is G that is e to the two phi times eta has the symmetry that if we basically uh, shift phi to phi minus A, and at the same time, we take this G hat, this in my case, it was eta. Uh, so if we, if we do the vial rescaling of eta to two A, then the action, uh, you know, the metric, of course, you know, if we shift this by two A, if we shift this by A, and then do the value scaling by two A, we, we get, we cancel the dependence on A. So this is a symmetry of this 2D background. But somehow, Lorentzian, uh, the Liouville action that uh, does not, uh, is not invariant under this. And what is invariant is actually the Liouville action itself uh, as a, in, as an action of phi and G hat. Sorry, this jihad that I'm writing, maybe it may, I hope it doesn't confuse you. It's always eta in this formula, but it can be general background metric. That's why I wanted to write it like. So, so basically the invariant under the shift is the Liouville action minus the volume term, which is basically the Liouville action for the field five being zero. So basically this is zero, this is zero, and this is one. So that's uh, when we said phi to zero. And this is precisely this integral over one, the volume term of this metric G hat uh, subtracted is the is the is this proper action the proper transformation of the measure that is invariant under this. Okay, great. Um, so uh, basically, uh, let me go quickly to the third topic uh, of the introduction, namely the hard to Hawking wave functions. And as uh, as I was telling you, as I was showing you on the first slide. I showed you that the wave function in any quantum field theory, in particular of this, in particular example of this free scalar, can be computed by the Euclidean action of your theory with some prescribed boundary condition, and then this becomes just wave function is actually a functional of this boundary condition. So Hartle and Hawking actually apply the same idea of using Euclidean path integrals in gravity for computing, say, wave function of the universe. And of course, how would you do that in gravity? Well, in gravity, of course, you, you want to fix some time slice T um, uh, equals to some particular value. And on this time slice, you, your, you know, your main degree of freedom is the metric. So you, you choose, choose the boundary condition such that your metric in gravity is equal to this induced metric on this time slice HIJ. HIJ. And then you take the somehow formal uh, path integral in gravity so over all possible metrics with the Euclidean action of gravity with the boundary condition uh, that the metric on this boundary on this slice is equal to this boundary condition. And that, and there's of course some normalization. Uh, Powell, I have a question. Uh, since you are using this boundary condition to evaluate this Euclidean path integral. So my question is uh, whether this is a Dirichlet boundary condition or Newman boundary condition or the mix up between the Dirichlet and Newman. So at so this you... point, it's it's actually a, a Dirichlet. Okay. But uh, you're, yeah, actually in, in the later part of my talk, uh, both of them will be important, so, so thanks. So here we, in some sense, we are imposing some Dirichlet bound, well, we fix the metric, so it's like a Dirichlet boundary condition. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, we just evaluate the gravity action with this pre prescribed boundary condition. Okay. Good, on this slide. But it, yeah, let, let me not say more. So, so basically, but, but of course, you know, as you can of course uh, already feel that this is in some sense very formal and very kind of heuristic definition of wave function in gravity. There are many problems, for example, how to deal with this uh, a very large, uh, uh, diffeomorphisms in variance in gravity and how to define proper quantum slices and so on. Because let me remind you, this should be like a quantum wave function of, you know, quantum gravity um, in a wave function, quantum wave function, but a wave function of a quantum universe in some sense, if we were able to define it and, uh, and compute, I'm not going to go into the great details of that in this talk. But I, uh, I have one question. Yes. So in this Euclidean path integral, you have restricted up to the 
Einstein Hilbert term along with the cosmological constant having a boundary term with extrinsic curvature. Yes. So yes. since you are doing the quantum uh, path integral, is it possible to allow the all alpha prime corrections in the gravity sector? Like yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that that's exactly my point. Like somehow you know, if in quantum gravity it's not clear what would be exactly the action that we wanted to put, should it be really string theory and alpha prime and whatnot corrections here? This will I, in most of the part of my talk. Uh, I, of course, you know we don't know the quantum precise quantum theory for this story, so I, I don't have anything sensible to say at the moment. Okay. But uh, from, let, let me just say that in my talk, I'll be most interested in semi-classical regime where we don't have to deal with these problems, but it's very important. Okay. And okay, so let me just tell you one more ingredient of this uh, hard to Hawking wave functions is of course that the usual, uh, so as Shannon noticed also, basically we'll be doing them just with, uh, with Einstein gravity, so Einstein Hilbert in general cosmological constant and the Gibbons Hawking term for this boundary delta m at some time slice here in their case. And then uh, basically the point is that the classical Hamiltonian constraint for uh, of, of this of this metric of, of gravity, namely the, the con condition constraint between the extrinsic curvature on this slice t, its trace. Uh, the re induced uh, Ricci scalar of this met induced metric as well as cosmological constant should be zero in, in, up, upon some uh, quantization procedure, or if we're talking about some quantum wave functions of the universe, that becomes the Wheeler, the, the famous wheeler debit equation that can be written in terms of uh, canonically conjugate momenta of gravity, this pi ij, that basically in quantum theory should be treated as derivatives with respect to this metric dhij. And somehow this wave uh, function of the universe, the quantum one should satisfy this Wheeler defeat equation. So for my talk, I'll be talking about the semi-classical regime. So you should only remember this Hamiltonian constraint, but this is just one slide. So you, so we are on the same page uh, about the history of this Wheeler defeat equation and Hartle Hawking wave functions. Okay. Um, I hope this formula now looks more familiar if you've seen how you compute wave functions in quantum field theory on the first slide. So maybe this doesn't look strange. Of course, you can you can intuitively sense that there's many problems. And even up to date, people are discussing if this hard to hooking uh, proposal actually makes sense and so on, how to define some contours. But it will not be important in my opinion. Here in this Hamiltonian, the small d is the spatial dimension. Ah. Good, good. So actually here, um, yes. So I'm thinking about this as the wave function for some gravity in D plus one dimensions. Yes, yes, yes. I got Thanks, it. thanks. Sorry, maybe this is like yeah, the D minus. This this should be, uh, yeah, for for D plus one dimensional gravity. Yes. Thanks. Okay, and finally, the last uh, topic that uh, uh, before I start, um, namely the link between tensor networks and ADS CFT. So, this, this dates back to some earlier works by Gifre Vidal on tensor network representations of CFT states in one plus one dimensions. And also the observation of Brian Swingle that. Uh, Basically, this tensor network, it's for the, in this case, in the original paper by Brian, it was the story was about a particular tensor uh, network called MERA uh, that represents states of, say, free boson or free fermion in one plus one dimensions. After we uh, basically, all you will need to know is that this is just some another representation of, uh, of a state of that system. So uh, let's say we are taking some critical many body uh, system. And uh, the, the external objects here represent some degrees of freedom, say some spins and so on. And then uh, basically, in general, you know that if we have many degrees of freedom, it's very hard to represent that state. But the idea of tensor network is that we can come up with some procedure of you know, coarse graining and simplifying the state in such a way that basically we all need certain number of or certain uh, properties of tensors. This, these are these blobs in this tensor network that, uh, that allow us to capture say structure of correlations and entanglement in the state. 
And basically uh, what Brian noticed is actually that this optimal, so if you optimize this tensor network in some procedure, say minimization of energy or some other variational ansatz, uh, basically this, at the end, you end up with such discrete geometry. And Brian pointed that uh, actually uh, this discrete geometry looks very much like slice of the dual ADS space. So let's say if you had some holographic CFT, and you are still allowed to represent this state in the CFT in some kind of tensor network, then it very much looks like the slice of time slice of ADS space time. And moreover, entanglement entropy of some degrees of freedom in this tensor network. So say I, I restrict to some number of physical degrees of freedom here, and I'm interested in entanglement von Neumann entropy of these degrees of freedom. On the tensor network, this, uh, this entropy is upper bounded by this discrete red slice through this tensor network. And of course, uh, on the right side, this is the famous Ryutakayanagi formula that tells you that entanglement entropy on the boundary of some interval on the boundary is computed in the, uh, in the bulk of ADS by, by the RT formula, namely by the length of this geodesic uh, that is denoted here as red. So, so basically that was the support and maybe motivation of Brian to propose that so somehow I, there, there should be. Like uh, the idea of tensor node network is a very famous in the context of many body quantum physics, particularly to write down the wave functions and to compute various observables and all. But like here, once you connect to ADS, what, what is the exact quantity they actually correspond? Like is the wave function of the tensor network is exactly equivalent to the hartle hawking wave function that you have you are telling in ADS they are equivalent to each other or some other quantities? Okay, great. That's, uh, that's another great question. So I, I, I hope I can shed some light on it by the end of my talk. That's somehow main, one of the main motivations of our talk. Okay. Yeah, so, but maybe from this slice, what you should take home is that, uh, that maybe, you know, we should, uh, because the general question is that, uh, uh, how exactly we want to extract geometry about holography from the states of the CFT. And, and basically this, uh, this uh, observation of Brian suggests that maybe we should, uh, we should think about the tensor networks, or in other words, the tensor, because in, in this particular tensor network mera, we really need to take into account the structure of entanglement in the CFT states. So, so we can think about the tensor networks as some geometry of entanglement of, in quantum states in some sense uh, that we will try to make precise. And, and basically the, 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 some of the new paradigm from this, uh, this work was that uh, basically the, the slices of holographic geometries should be could be thought of as tensor network representation of CFT wave function. So, so in other words, if you ask how the geometry of the bulk is encoded in the CFT state, this could be one way to one way to demonstrate. If we know somehow the geometry of quantum entanglement in the picture of this tensor network, we can think about it as some particular slice of ADS. And this will be one of the main themes of the rest of my talk. But uh, actually, the, also the second motivation that came from this tensor network developments uh, has to do with complexity. So how, do we did, how did we start thinking about complexity? Well, actually, um, this dates back to the works of Hartmann and Maldacena that studied the so-called time-evolved thermophile double state. So basically, we start with some uh, uh, purification of the thermal state uh, that, is, uh, that is given by this psi beta of t. The exact form is not important uh, for now, but I, I hope you are familiar with the usual term of field double state. And then we do the time evolution. So the non-trivial time evolution of the term of field double is like this exponent uh, evolution with the Hamiltonian that is a sum of the left and right Hamiltonians. And what Hartmann and Maldison notice is that the entanglement entropy in this state follows the usual uh, uh, evolution as in the quantum quench. So in, in a global quantum quench. So in particular, it initially grows linearly with time but then if we look at this entanglement entropy for some interval A and B on both sides of this thermophile double state, then actually it saturates already uh, after the time of order L over two, where L is the size of the interval. And then they presented some uh, uh, tensor network like picture for this time evolved thermophile double state. So for the usual thermophile double, 
we it's natural to expect that there should be some tensor network that is basically you know that that, that has some degrees of freedom on left side and on the right side here i'm considering cft on the line at finite temperature but then uh, uh, what hartman maldeson argued that in order to explain their evolution one should one an evolution of this you know geodesic in the bulk that computes this entanglement entropy between a and b one should think about some tensor network that grows with time uh, and this should correspond to this evolution here. Um, but as I pointed already after times of order L over T, this entanglement saturates, but somehow if this picture of the tensor network is correct, uh, already after this time of order L2, I mean, still after this time of order L over two, the, this tensor network should still be growing. <clears throat> and actually this was observed first by Saskai and uh, that, that pointed that actually, uh, you know, maybe the knowing the entanglement structure of the quantum state is not enough. Uh, so in other words, uh, even though um, we can compute the entanglement entropy, we see that it saturates, but there's still something happening in the state, simply the size of this tensor network or in the gravity dual, the sign, sign uh, sorry, the size of the Einstein-Rosen bridge keeps growing uh, even after the saturation of entanglement. And that motivated him to, um, uh, somehow propose that one should start thinking about the complexity of the state in addition of an, uh, in, on the top of entanglement. And he, in particular, he asked, what is the CFT dual of this growth of the tensor network or growth of the Einstein-Rosen bridge after the times of order over two? And he suggest, uh, suggested that this should be related, this growth should be related to some notion of complexity of this time evolved thermophile double state. And roughly what he had in mind was like the number of tensors that keeps growing with time from this picture. And maybe you're familiar, this started a lot of developments on actually how to define this complexity in, in, in the dual CFT and how to quantify it in a good way. And that will also be part of, of the second, this will also play an important role in the second part of my talk. So I have a question, Pavel. So yes, please. Which, which uh, physics or what condition actually uh, helps you to decide the saturation value of this entanglement entropy. You mean what does the saturation value depend on? Yes. What are the parameters? Which basically I am uh, asking that, like, on which kind of uh, like parameters in the theory this saturation actually depends on. Mm -hmm. Great. So actually, as in, in the maybe you're familiar also in these computations of quantum quenches, is mm -hmm. the same as I already mentioned. Is the same kind of protocol and the same evolution. And then I actually I didn't your idea. Right, I didn't notice what is the I didn't mark what is the final value. But basically, the final value should correspond to the entropy density of the thermal state. Okay. This is this this basically has to do with the fact that you 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 evolve your quantum state and then after some time, basically the state thermalizes. Yeah, and 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 then and, and then of course it's a very good question. What is the value of this thermal uh, thermalized entropy density? And this, in general, uh, in this computation by Hard and Mal and Maldasena, that just depends on the central charge and the beta, the inverse temperature. Okay. But actually, one can consider more general cases. For example, charge thermophile double, and you can check that it also depends on the uh, on the chemical potential according to let's say generalized Gibson sample. So, so, so this this the final value depends on uh, on uh, basically thermal density entropy of the state that that is sensitive to say conserved charges of the model and so on. And at the time scale L by two, the quench profile is switched on. Oh, sorry. So the quench is switched on at time t equals to zero. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and from that point point, you basically and do the time level. Confused because. I want to understand that when quench was introduced and then I know that you need a little bit of time to thermalize the system. It is not yes, exactly. to thermalize the system immediately. So that's why yeah. I'm asking that which value. Ah, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, so indeed, indeed that's, you're right. So basically in this case, uh, this quench was started at equals to zero and you know you needed some time of order L over two for because you were probing this thermalization of, uh, with entropy of the interval of, or of size L. So after size of L over two, you, you in, in say holographic CFT, you, you see the sharp thermalization here. 
in more like rational CFTs or some, you know, uh, harmonic chains, this is more smooth, this transition between you know, the growth phase and the saturation. But this has been indeed studied in various condensed matter systems as well. Okay, great. So uh, basically, um, this led, uh, as I told you, the, there has been interesting uh, stories, like this, this, this has been some interesting motivation for field theory, but actually also um, in original papers by Saskain and collaborators, they proposed the gravity uh, measure of this complexity, the same way as we have some uh, Rita Gayanagi measure of entanglement. Um, uh, these groups argued that actually on the gravity side, uh, the good probe or good measure of the size of the einstein rosen bridge would be basically a volume of this maximal uh, basically a volume of the maximal volume slice uh, between the left and the right uh, thermophile double state. And then later they improved it or they proposed an alternative description in terms of the action, uh, or gravity action evaluated on uh, this so-called wheeler david patch of the bulk. Uh, this again will be not important in my talk, which I'll be mostly working in CFT, but, but basically the main message is that we, we are expecting that this complexity, whatever it is, on the field theory side should somehow be related to more fine grained degrees of freedom of gravity. So in other words, that complexity should be related to really the full power of GR and not just some geodesic length or area as, as you take an in some sense. And in, in, in the, and all these uh, ideas with complexity, they started the new direction in field theories and in particular in holographic CFTs with the aim to define this, uh, this maybe circuit complexity or using Nielsen approach to complexity. We've been all working trying to quantify uh, the complexity or, of, of various states, in particular of this time-dependent thermophile double state. And, and of course, there's also some, uh, some develop, there's also a big part of the community trying to make the bridge between those holographic proposals and, and the field theory ones as well. But uh, but as I was trying to stress, this is somehow very interesting for, from my personal point of view. It's some new direction and new exploration where similarly to developments from entanglement, we now want to probe quantum field theories from the perspective of this complexity or circuit complexity by studying uh, free theories and uh, maybe CFTs, uh, CFTs in two and higher dimensions and their relation to GR. And in all these models, we want to study some notions of complexity and trying to figure out which is the right one. So we are still nowhere near the, fi the, the final goal or the, and the final word in this program, but this is somehow my, the rest of my talk of my research will be exactly in this kind of context. Okay, great. So this is actually the end of my introduction. Let me just check. Oh, okay, <laughs> I already took like more than uh, 40 minutes, but I, I hope at least uh, this will be useful to the program. So are there any questions about the introduction? Okay, if not, then I'll, I'll move on. So um, now the introduction to the general uh, talk and general uh, motivations behind this work is, uh, is basically ADS-CFT. So as you know, this is the duality proposed by Maldosena already many years ago in 97. And it tells us that uh, some quantum mechanical systems called conformal field theories or CFTs for short, they are exactly equivalent to gravity theories uh, on ADS geometries. So somehow we should be thinking about generically some string theory or quantum gravity theories, but also to some, in some regime of this diction, or correspondence, we'll be interested in gravity theories and ADS. And then uh, ADS-CFT tells us that there is a dictionary between quantum states of this, uh, of this CFT or this quantum mechanical systems and different geometries in the gravity side. So in particular, for example, we can take the vacuum state of a CFT and this sh it should be dual to the empty space time of ADS and the thermal state should be dual to black hole in ADS and so on and so forth. There should be some there can be some small excitations of various fields on this bag, uh, sorry, small excitations uh, from various operators in CFT corresponding to various excitations in the bulk. Uh, but in general, we can actually test it very precisely. So say in N equals four super young meals or ABJM model, we can, uh, we can do very elaborate and explicit computations and check that indeed 
computations in expectation values in some states of CFT can be reproduced uh, from computations in this bulk geometries. But something that is still, uh, so, so in particular, uh, now if you are interested in uh, the states of on the left side of this uh, of the story if you are interested in states of cft um, you can um, as i was showing you before you can define them using final path integral as basically doing the path integral of euclid and action over all possible fields that you have in your holographic field theory so this can be this is the same formula for n equals four super young will say and for some holographic cfts in two dimensions you define your wave functionals or the states by this path integral of these prescribed boundary conditions. And what holography tells you that somehow this definition of the state in holographic CFT should hide information about ADS. So uh, if you compute it for vacuum or for the, from the thermal state, you, you somehow uh, in, uh, by ADS CFT, this path integral knows about this correspondence. And the question is how? Uh, and then the motivation of our research was precisely how can we extract this information about geometry from this path integral formulation or definition of states. So, um, so this we've been developing in this uh, kind of uh, goal, uh, two, two steps, uh, two or two branch program. Namely, first one was what is the basic mechanism behind ATS CFT and how do we see the emergent holographic geometry from CFT path integrals? That's number one. Uh, and actually, I'll talk more about this today. And the second one is the, the idea of determining complexity of quantum states in, in, this, in this kind of for, motivated by these ideas of, um, uh, of SAS kind, uh, but more closely to this, uh, basically, how can we, uh, thinking about the states as some tensor networks, how can we count these tensor networks and how can we come up with a notion of complexity of this of these networks that prepares the state in some particular way in holographic CFTs. That was the motivation of this. And as I was showing you before, uh, we wanted to get the ideas from, or we, we imported lots of ideas from these slides that I was showing you before, uh, and that somehow this CFT state uh, as represented by some tensor network in some geometric way uh, should be related to a time slice of ADS. We want, we ask the question, whether we can uh, uh, we can basically import this idea directly to the continuum uh, CFT or continuum uh, large C holographic CFT setups, uh, and uh, basically we wanted to turn this observation into some genuine tool in genuine ADS CFT. So, for example. Uh, as I will show in the in the later part of my talk, the the idea of path integral optimization is exactly uh, trying to implement this observation in the continuous uh, CFT holographic CFT setup. Okay, so uh, basically uh, the main idea of this path integral optimization, so in, in some sense coming back to our playground of path integrals, is to start with the definition of the state using Euclid and path integral, and now ask the question, how can we actually optimize this wave function in the same way as we somehow optimize tensor networks in many body systems. How can we extract geometry from this path integral given a quantum state? And finally, how can we quantify complexity of these path integrals that prepare for you a particular state? So in other words, how can we define the complexity of states directly based on the path integral preparation of the state? Is the motivation clear? Yes, could you please tell something about why we need to optimize the path integral? Oh, <clears throat> so, so actually, we in, in, in principle, actually, we don't need to optimize it if, if we know how to compute it. But in some sense, um, this, this optimized word comes from this intuition of tensor networks that somehow we have some representation of a state of many body state. And you know, if we are powerful enough to store all this information about the state in some particular super powerful computer, then we would not need to do any approximation or optimization of the of the representation of the state. But somehow uh, we want to discard some information about the state while keeping only relevant part. And then uh, this comes from this optimization or somehow the tensor network 
optimization in these pictures. So we wanted, we, uh, and some of these optimizations, so, so in some sense, the unoptimized tensor network might, might, might not look like some geometry that is related to the slice of ADS, if you want more intuition, but only after the optimization, this tensor network is related to the slices of ADS. So in, in, in some sense, when I talk about the optimization, that's, that's what I have in my mind, that maybe, you know, generic information from the wave function will not look like some slices of ADS, but only after the optimization, it will, it will have certain properties. Okay? Okay. Thanks. Okay, great. <clears throat> I'm actually asking you too many questions. No, no, that's really great. Actually, they're all relevant. So I, I, I hope other participants are also here. I'm not sure. No, I, I, the main reason is I have a few students who is actually working on with me on the same topic. So I, uh, I'm asking on behalf of them so that things would be clear to them as well. Great, great. That's, that's very nice to hear. And uh, please, uh, <laughs> ask as many questions as you want. Uh, okay, great. So how do we do this path integral optimization in, in, few, in, in simple steps? Well, basically we start from the, and let me just say again, like your questions are very relevant. So they, and they are motivated by this discrete tensor network ideas, but somehow we want to give up this link to tensor networks. And, uh, and we really want to work in the continuum on the base of path integrals, but maybe using the same words as in tensor network and see if they can help us to get some extra intuition or insights to, to extraction of the geometry. So, so, so in some sense, I, I, from now on, I really want to focus on this path integral and everything what I said from now can be just re regarded as basically independent new construction that has nothing to do in particular in principle with tensor networks. So hopes, hopefully it will not confuse you um, uh, from now on. So, okay, so let me just exp explain this path integral optimization that we proposed with Milai, uh, Masamichi, Tadashi, and Kento in 2017. And in this construction, basically we start from this left picture, which, uh, which is the usual Euclidean space on which we compute say wave function for the vacuum state, as I was showing you uh, before for the circle, for example, uh, that would be the wave function for, uh, in, of the vacuum of the CFT on the circle. But here I'm interested in the vacuum of a CFT on the line. So that would instead should be done on say half plane. And this is the original path integral. So I need to perform the path integration with prescribed boundary condition. And this tau is the Euclidean time at some particular value. It can be at tau equals to zero or tau equals to epsilon. This is for convenience. And, and this, in, this, in this original definition, I'm introducing some UV cut of epsilon where basically uh, each of the degrees of freedom are regulated by this cutoff. And then at each point of this, uh, of this slice, I have some epsilon order, you know, this is some size epsilon square plaquette on which I have to do some path integration. So if you wanted to, again, think about tensor networks, you, you're starting from some tensor network where you, that is not optimal. That's like somehow the representation of the original state uh, with prescribed boundary condition. And then you have to do like very difficult path integral optimization in each of these uh, rectangles here. Actually, there should be squares here of, or epsilon by epsilon. Uh, and then this for, computes for you a wave function as a functional of this boundary condition here. This is X is the, uh, the real space. So but then so what we do just, is that instead of... Yes. Ask you one thing. This tau is basically the time slice values you are talking about. This tau... So here... Tau is it so physical time or conformal time? This tau here in this picture is just a Euclidean time. So let's say I have the Euclid CFT in Euclidean plane, d tau square plus dx square. Okay, 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 okay. Good. And in this Euclidean plane, uh, but now, uh, you know, to, uh, to go to our optimization and somehow the path integral tensor networks, we, we approximate, well, in some sense, we approximate or we, we choose to represent this original wave function by wave function computed instead of not on the flat space, but on the curved geometry, such that basically we impose the same boundary condition. So it's, as you remember from my computation in the first, uh, of the first point, you know, the, the wave function is the, is the functional of this boundary condition here. So we choose to compute this wave function on this geometry, but such 
that the, the geometry here is the same as in the original one. So we impose the same boundary condition. That means that the wave function that we compute is exactly the same as the original one. But now we compute this wave function, not in the flat geometry, but on a curved one. So what that means in particular, if you want to think in discrete, is that here, as we go in the Euclidean direction tau, we do the less path integration here and the less path integration here and even less and less and here. So uh, as I will show you um, in the continuum, this basically uh, gives rise, you can think about this as basically some kind of hyperbolic tensor networks that then you will interpret as a slice of the dual ADS geometry. And, and in general, of course, I have to tell you how I'm choosing this matrix G. And this will be done by this optimization, as you already asked. So the way we will be implementing the optimization of this wave function on the different geometries will be basically uh, by taking the wave function computed in this geometry uh, to the wave function computed in this geometry, original one, we'll define this as exponent of some functional of this metric G that we call the path integral complexity. And we'll be choosing G such that uh, uh, the G will be solving, will be minimizing this path integral complexity. So in particular, we'll be solving the equations of motion of this functional of G with the right boundary condition that this, uh, the metric here matches the original one. Uh, and uh, such that, uh, and this optimal geometries G in the continuum, they will be, you can think about them as this optimal tensor networks that are hyperbolic. I will show you this explicitly in the moment, but that's exactly the, the idea of the path integral optimization. And as you remember from here, from my first computation, if you compute the ratio, actually the dependence on the boundary condition drops because uh, basically the, this dependence on the boundary condition is some exponent and then dependence on the metric is, is captured only by this Jacobian factor or this normalization. And precisely what we'll be interested here in is exactly this normalization that I was computing you to, be, to, to you before. Okay, and then we'll be compute, when, what we'll be calling the complexity or the, of the particular state, it'll be exactly the, the on-shell value of this action or the minimal value, you know, the minimization of this functional over all possible choices of G. Okay, so this is maybe a cartoonish and abstract, but let me just show you an explicit example that, that now once you've survived my introduction, this should be actually clear why this is the case. So let's go back to 2D CFTs. So again, in 2D CFTs, uh, any possible metric that we can put on 2D metric has the form as some background metric G hat times the by factor phi. And as I showed you from this computation of Polyakov, the, actually the CFT action is invariant on the, under the value rescaling. So only the change in the wave function or computing by wave function will be precisely due to this cha anomalous change of the measure of the path integral. And then the ch measure of the path integral changes with the exponent of this Liouville action minus this volume subtract. So in particular, the ratio of the wave function that I showed you here in this path integral optimization is very, very universal and is very geometric and is only given in terms of this uh, vial factor phi and then, uh, and then the background metric G hat. And it's universal in the sense that for any 2D CFT, if you specify the central charge, it will only enter as the overall prefactor. So you can take C to be very large as in holographic CFTs or C to be one in, in three theories, and the action will be the same. So in some sense, it's completely universal. And then the second, uh, maybe the second uh, information that, that you also remember from our first computation is this coefficients of the volume term, uh, which is usually referred to as a cosmological constant of the theory. This is directly related to this regularization from the heat kernel. So you should, should remember this mu corresponds to basically choosing particular UV regulator epsilon, one over epsilon. So in other words, this complexity, uh, this path integral complexity in 2D CFT simply becomes this difference of the Liouville action. And, uh, and now the optimization, as I told you, it comes by uh, simply minimizing this path integral complexity. And that, that simply corresponds to solving the equations of motion of the Liouville action. And the equations of motion of the Liouville action, maybe they're abstractly written this way. So for any background metric G hat, uh, uh, of this action here for any G hat, the Liouville equation can be written like this. 
but this is equivalent to the constraint that the metric of the 2D geometry, so the full metric, this e to the 2 phi times g hat, should be just constant negative, should be 2 times mu. Mu is positive for, for this part of my tool. And, uh, and indeed, it tells you that this optimal metrics that we are talking about in this past cynical optimization, they are all uh, hyperbolic of constant negative curvature. So in particular, if we choose the flat background metric in some complex coordinate w and w bar, this is the standard Liouville equation. So it's a box phi equals to mu times the potential e to the two phi. And the boundary condition that I told you about before is such that the metric has to be the same as the original here at this particular value of tau equals to zero or tau equals to epsilon corresponds to basically choosing this solution of Liouville equation uh, uh, satisfying one over epsilon square at tau equals to zero. So actually, this is a very well known and and you know, solved in maybe several centuries ago problem, and we know the general solution to the Liouville equation can be written in terms of two functions: a as a function of the complex coordinate w, and b as a function of w bar. So basically, for each particular state that we'll be interested in, we will just choose different a and b, and make sure that they satisfy this condition. So for example, for the vacuum, uh, we just need to do this path integral optimization on upper half plane or half plane. And we can find indeed that there's a solution of Liouville equation that is given by one over tau square and at tau equals to epsilon satisfies our boundary condition one over epsilon square. And this metric corresponds to just nothing but your hyperbolic plane, of course, in this coordinate tau. On the other hand, if we do this path integral optimization on the strip of size beta over two, so at, at tau minus beta over four to beta over four, we get one over cosine two pi tau over beta. And actually you can check that this is again, nothing but the time slice uh, of the eternal BTZ black hole. So it's actually the time slice of the Einstein Rosen bridge. On the other hand, if we take the prime path integral optimization for the primary state, including the vacuum, this is actually the similar to the computation I was showing before. We do this computation on the disk with some insertion at the center, and then the, the energy of the insertion corresponds to the, the dimension of the primary operator by this way, a minus a equals to one minus 12 h over c. Then actually we can define, we can find exactly the solutions that are then uh, interpreted as time slices of conical singularities in ADS, and we can actually check this. So this, this procedure actually can be generalized uh, beyond CFTs and in uh, works with, uh, uh, in this group with also with Arpan and Shumi Tas uh, and guys from Kyoto, we managed to generalize it for deformations of CFT. And we checked if we perturb a CFT with some relevant operator then uh, basically we can find again the solution of this path integral optimization that describes the time slice of ADS geometry with the bug reaction from the scalar field with mass uh, you know, related to the dimensions as, as usual holography predicts. And, by, and we could also do it for more general complicated metrics uh, like for inhomogeneous CFT and so on, but I will not have time to talk about. Okay, uh, so uh, basically I told you uh, also at the beginning of my talk that uh, that uh, uh, we want to uh, inter we want to have some notion of complexity from this path integral approach and indeed um, we define the, the the complexity of a particular state as uh, as actually minimum over the over this action uh, over all possible choices of the vial factor with this reference metric g hat where this i the complexity was basically the difference of the Liouville action and actually, what you what you should do, the way you should think about this complexity is actually the relative complexity between, say, two tensor networks. One tensor network given by G hat that is uh, that is this right part of this i, and the other tensor network as e to the two phi times G hat. So uh, so basically, this this path integral complexity is from the start is actually a relative path integral complexity, not some absolute number. In, and this is very clear in the properties of this action. So for example, if you change, if you think about this metric as G1 and then this one as G2, if you flip G1 and G2, this complex, this path integral complexity tells you that this is related to the original simply by minus its value. 
And uh, uh, another another property is the triangle equality. So if you take free metrics, let's say G1, G2, and G3 that I all related by some relative value rescaling, then actually the path integral complexity, the sum of the two is equal to the third one between G and G3 with the intermediate G2. And from this first property, you can see that actually this path integral complexity can be negative simply because you know if one is positive if you flip those two it's negative and it's natural to expect because you know if one if you basically count the number of tensors then and one tensor network requires 100 tensors and the other tensor network requires 50 then of course the, the difference between those numbers can be negative if you take it in in the other order so that's why I, I really want to stress that this path integral complexity is the relative complexity, not so much a distance measure. Like for example, if you were, uh, if you are interested in complexity measures based on distance between, let's say, vacuum and some particular state, then by definition that complexity is uh, non-negative because the distance has to be always positive. But this path integral complexity can be negative, and that's fine because the way we define it as a relative complexity. And actually, so let me just also stress that there has been some interesting works, uh, for example, by Bartek Czech, trying to really take this Liouville action and interpret each terms as basically counting different tensors. Uh, in, for example, in Mera tensor networks, like kinetic term should correspond to the number of unitaries and maybe the, sorry, potential term to the number of unitaries and kinetic term to the number of isometries and so on. This is some intuitive uh, understanding. Um, also in the work with Javier Magan, uh, we were trying to generalize these ideas from CFTs to so-called Virazoro circuits, where we could actually count these Virazoro gates into the CFTs. And in that case, we showed also that one can come up with particular cost functions that give you Liouville action as the answer, even in this Nielsen approach. And finally, in paper by Tadashi, he wrote uh, uh, that he generalized this idea to more general slices, not just time slices of ADS, but more like uh, Lorentzian geometries and you know some partially time, uh, you know partially, well, some some Lorentzian slices, so time-like and space-like slices. And he was also arguing that this Liouville action, at least for the static configurations, it gives you the same answer as the Wheeler-David action in particular classes of geometry. So, so please refer to his paper for exactly this, this correspondence. Okay, um, and finally, maybe the higher dimensional, because most of the things I told you about now were about two-dimensional uh, pattern the optimization. And in, in the following paper, also with the group in Kyoto at the time, uh, we, we generalize this path integral complexity and path integral optimization to higher dimensions, but somehow phenomenologically. So basically uh, we wanted to ask the question, what would be the higher dimensional action that gives rise to like equations of motion from optimization that are hyperbolic geometries uh, or slices of ADS? And that would uh, have certain properties like this co-cycle properties, as I was showing you here, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned, but these are called co-cycle properties of this complexity action. And, uh, and basically maybe other uh, interesting uh, properties of the action that Liouville action satisfied, in particular, if we take D to a two limit, it would reduce to this difference of Liouville actions. And actually we wrote down this proposal, we checked that this action satisfies all these constraints um, as our higher dimensional path integral optimization. But soon after we realized that actually this action that we are writing is nothing but Einstein-Hilbert action in D dimensions, not in D plus one dimensions, but D dimensions, uh, but they're written explicitly for the metric, uh, for the vial risk of the G hat metric. So if you take G hat times E to the two phi and plug it to this Einstein-Hilbert action in D dimensions, you precisely reproduce our action with the correct coefficients G Newton of G Newton in front. So in particular from this action, it is clear that um, the equations of motion from this action are nothing but the trace of Einstein's equations, because we only, you see, we, when we compute equations of motion, we don't vary over the whole metric, but only over the vial factor. And then the trace of Einstein's equation is nothing but the requirement that the Ricci scalar of the metric D uh, in D dimensions should be constant and constant negative if you study this in ADS. Um, okay, great. Uh, sorry. Um, oh, 
are there any questions? Sorry, I just see now something from the chat. No, you just proceed. Uh, okay. Okay, great, great. Um, so this was the, in some sense, this was the story of path integral optimization uh, uh, from you know 2017 and, and various developments from then up to recently. Uh, and but then if there are any, uh, I think if there are any questions about this program and this construction, I think this is a great stop because uh, I, from now on I will describe these more recent works on on the holographic path integral optimization. You may proceed. Okay, great. I don't know if everything is clear or I lost most of the audience. So any questions are welcome. <laughs> so please, uh, please feel free. Okay, so basically, uh, uh, I told you uh, up to now, I was telling you that we have a certain procedure in uh, conformal field theories, arbitrary ones, as well as the holographic ones, if you tune your C to be very large that allows you to extract some geometry from a particular state. And this optimal geometry of a state uh, is hyperbolic. So uh, solves the trace of Einstein's equations in the dimensions. Um, and, uh, and we can think about it in some, in some sense, if we formally, if we formally uh, think about this Euclidean time tau as the radial direction, in some formal way, we could think about these geometries as time slices of ADS geometries that are dual to the states for which we do path integral optimization. So uh, this is very interesting and, uh, and somehow attracted a lot of attention, but, uh, but the, the question we wanted to ask uh, in, in this recent works, the recent part of development is really now focused on holographic CFTs and say that we, we apply this path integral optimization for the wave function in holographic CFT, what would be the gravity dual picture of this, uh, of this procedure? What does it mean to put, a, to, to put a CFT path integral on different virus scale geometry and doing, and what does it mean to do uh, the optimization? And then we end up with some hyperbolic metric. How can we interpret it from the holographic point of view? And you know, after my introduction, of course, probably something should be, it should be clear for you that I still haven't used the hard locking wave functions. So that's where they enter. And uh, so this comes with, this came in this work with my student, uh, Jan Boruch and Tadashi Takayanagi uh, late last year. And we proposed to do the following computation of the hard locking wave function but not in flat space or the sitter spaces in the standard hartle hawking computations, but this time in really ADS holographic setup. So um, in particular, uh, we'll be interested in uh, hartle hawking wave functions. So basically path integral in gravity in ADS. This is the picture for ADS free, but actually I'll be doing it in ADSD. In the particular region of a region that is re, uh, that is drawn here with the shade as some shaded region that I call M. And let me unpack this picture slowly. So here on the axis, I'm taking the Euclidean time of of the usual ADS uh, geometry. So I'm, I'm thinking about the Euclidean ADS in this story. Uh, Euclidean time t, Euclidean time tau. There's a perpendicular x direction for the for the spatial part of, uh, of the boundary that uh, for simplicity, I take this to be homogeneous. So everything will be homogeneous in X. And then here, the Z direction is really the, uh, the, the radial direction of ADS. Say this is picture in Poincaré ADS. And in, uh, you know, if we want to compute the hartle hawking wave function or the path integral in the gravity in ADS, we have to uh, we have to care about the asymptotic boundary of ATS, which is here drawn by the surface sigma. So here I'm introducing at z equals to epsilon. I'm just putting this surface. This is where my boundary sits. And then I have surface sigma. And then I'm choosing some other surface Q that bounds this region M. And then I call, I define this surface Q by some function, basically a z as a function f of tau. 
Okay, so this is the definition of the surface Q. On the surface Q, so this is uh, this is in th this time tau here is the same as the time tau on the boundary. On the surface Q, it will be convenient for me to introduce the so-called conformal time. It will be just some coordinate W that we will run from along the surface Q such that at W equals to zero, the surface Q will meet the surface sigma at the point Z equals to epsilon. And then this W will go all the way to infinity. Okay. So in this region M, I will now be interested in the hartle hawking wave function. Namely, I'll, want, I'll be interested in some path integral over all possible boundary conditions, sorry, over all possible configurations of the metric with a prescribed boundary condition, uh, which means the induced metric on Q that I will choose to have a form that the metric, the induced metric on Q will be of the form e to the two times phi this is the vial factor times the flat metric. So this will be my boundary condition for the induced metric on Q. And as you remember, the wave function, the hartle hawking wave function is the functional of this boundary condition. So in our computation, this will be a functional of this vial factor phi on Q, okay? Uh, I have not specified, so here I'll be doing this path integral uh, what is the with the Einstein-Hilbert action. So this will be the Einstein-Hilbert action Gibbons Hawking term, as I'll show you in a moment. What will be a novel thing here uh, will be a, this extra term with T and T will correspond to a tension term. I will show it in a moment. And basically this will correspond to studying the surface Q that has a tension. So basically we'll consider a family of hard to hooking wave functions for each value of the tension parameter of the surface of Q. And this will be computed by the path in the hard to hooking wave function, not only with pure gravity action, but with also the tension term, which basically goes as tension times volume of the surface Q. So these are our hard to hooking wave function in ADS. And uh, and basically the metric that I will be talking about here on Q uh, explicitly will be written as the file factor times the flat metric in this coordinate W. So this will be the coordinate W here and with this form. And we'll be choosing this file factor e to the two phi uh, to be equal to one over the function, this function that parameterizes the Q uh, and, and boundary condition on this phi Basically the boundary condition at W equals to zero will be such that the surface, that the metric on Q has to be the same as the metric on Sigma, which will be one over epsilon square for E to the vial factor. Okay, so at the moment, this is, I, I'm not saying, I'm not talking about any relation with the path integral optimization. I'm just presenting you some interesting computation in the gravity side. And you can just think about it as some independent gravity computation of some wave function in any ADS CFT setup. Okay. How what is the relation with the hard optimization will become clear in a moment. But here I'm talking about some gravity computation on. Uh, is this setup clear at the moment? Yes. Okay, great. And then, of course, um, you know, I'm not going to quantize gravity for you at this talk. So actually, the way we will be able to compute this hard to hawking wave functions will be purely semi-classically. So we'll be thinking about this surface Q as just some probe surface Q in the, in the bulk of ADS. So I'll be taking the solution of gravity in ADS3, and I'll take some probe brain Q. And in the probe brain Q limit, I'll evaluate this action, this hard to hawking wave functions, a function as basically exponent of the on shell action between sigma and Q. And this is precisely what I'm writing here. So the semi classical hard to hawking wave function will be exponent of the on shell gravity action. So this is Einstein, Hilbert, and Gibbons Hawking with cosmological constant. And then we'll add the tension term to the surface Q. Sorry, I mean, N here means. Uh, I mean, it should be written as D. So, so basically there will be a gravity in D plus one dimensions and the, sorry, sorry, N, N, N is actually D plus one. So this, I will be talking about gravity in D plus one dimensions and on D dimensional, uh, Q will be a D dimensional slice of the ball. 
And, and once we evaluate this Hartle Hawking wave function up to the surface Q, we will then maximize it uh, with respect to the choice of this Weil factor phi. So as, as, as I told you, basically the Hartle Hawking wave functional is a functional for any boundary condition, for any, any Weil factor phi, we will get some, and any value of the tension, we will get some uh, wave function phi but it will not be maximal. It will be just any way function, uh, functional of this boundary condition. But now we tell you to maximize this hartle hawking wave function with respect to, the, for, for, to this Weil factor phi. Why maximize? Actually, this is very natural in the computation of some gravity correlation functions, right? When we compute some local uh, observables, let's say in quantum gravity in the bulk, we take the hartle hawking wave function we insert these operators and then basically semi-classically we have to maximize over the hard working wave function. That's the, uh, so, so in some sense, this may be an intuitive why maximization and not minimization. And uh, from this, uh, you know, from this maximization, uh, this maximization, uh, this is also related to the question I think Shantan asked at the beginning. Actually, this maximization will be equivalent to imposing the Neumann boundary condition on the surface Q. So in particular, maximal surfaces, maximal, maximal surfaces Q or maximal induced matrix on this Q will be the ones that satisfy Neumann boundary condition. So that the induced uh, extrinsic curvature of this metric and induced metric satisfy this particular equation with the tension parameter. In particular, if you take a trace of it, then the extrinsic trace of extrinsic curvature will be proportional to the tension. And this, this uh, so in other words, like in gravity or cosmology, these slices of the bulk that I'll be talking about, they are so-called constant mean curvature slices because K is usually referred to as mean curvature. So this will be the optimum, so maximal, uh, this will be a slices that maximize heart wave functions in ADS. This is very maybe a comment is that this is very much in the spirit of the ADS BCFT construction of Tadashi, if you are also familiar with that. Okay, so is this computation is this idea clear? Yes. Good. So I'll be computing semi-classical hard to hawking wave functions and looking at them as a function also phi and t, and then I'll be maximizing over them with respect to phi. Great. So then the pro comes the, here comes the proposal. So we propose that this uh, semi-classical hartle hawking wave functions computed in ADS with boundary uh, uh, procedure is actually, you should think about it as a gravity dual of this uh, path integral optimization, or in other words, you should think about it as a holographic path integral optimization in the following sense that then this maximal matrix on Q, the matrix that, satis that maximize hard to hawking wave functions, they are the same as the matrix of, from the path integral optimizations for particular states. So they are in some sense gravity duals of this matrix from path integral optimization that I described in the first part of my talk. And then the second part is that the gravitational action, uh, including the Hayward term, actually I didn't talk about it here, but uh, when we have some regions of the bulk, when we have some non-smooth boundaries, so in particular at sigma and q, when they meet, there is a corner. And here, to have a well-defined gravitational variational principle, we have to include the uh, Hayward term. And then uh, basically, if we evaluate this onshore gravity action with the Hayward term, this gravity action will play the role of our complexity functional, so this, this path integral complexity functional that I was showing you before in the CFT, but with finite cutoff corrections. And what that means is that if we take, if we compute this finite gravity action, uh, and then we take the so-called UV limit of, of maybe small fluctuations of this Weil factor, we'll actually precisely derive this path integral optimization action that I was telling you that we conjectured from the field theory. Basically, that conjecture was somehow phenomenological, but here we can derive this as a UV limit of this gravity action. I will show you how this works in a particular way. Important thing also in these computations is that we will not like the, that this tension term that will be very interesting. It was not interpreted. It was. It didn't have. It was not interpreted before in the path integral optimization story. So somehow the whole path integral optimization can be thought of as t equals to zero. So without the tension term. 
But in this story, the tension term will be important and we should think about the basically uh, not zero tension slices of the bulk as some kind of suboptimal tensor networks in the same way as you can think about Mera tensor network that is not optimized in some way. This will become clear in the moment. Okay, so that's our proposal. Let me show you how this works maybe in the vacuum example. Uh, so this becomes very concrete and clear. Okay, so if we take the vacuum, this is nothing but uh, the ADS Poincare metric. Um, and we, and as I told you, we compute the, the we take this as your on shell solution. And then in that geometry, uh, in that solution of Einstein's equations in ADS D plus one, we compute the action between the boundary and the probe brain Q. And this is very easy to compute. So you can evaluate this exactly without any approximation. Uh, from Einstein, Hilbert, Gibbons, Hawking, and also tension term, and the answer is this, where this Vx and Lx are basically the volume, uh, like the integrals over the volume of the special direction and the time direction tau. And this action is a functional of the metric, so, so basically we, uh, of this induced metric on Q, and basically, as you can see, this is the piece that comes from basically the surface sigma that didn't have, that only had the divergent contribution, but all the interesting things come, all the interesting information about this vial factor comes in this part. And, and in this, this G of phi is basically such a non, in some sense, non-local or uh, contribution from, from the surface Q. So it has basically the, the square root in this action of Q, it's the square root of the derivative and then still also some arc sign, blah, blah, blah. This can be done explicitly, but it's, it's really exact. It's, there's no approximation in this semi-classical computation. And then in the maximization, we basically solve the equations of motion from this action, which means we take the saddle point with respect to phi. And that corresponds to imposing a Neumann boundary condition on Q, as I was arguing before. Or in other words, you can check explicitly that the equation of motion is equivalent to setting the trace of extrinsic curvature being proportional to T so-called CMC or constant mean curvature slice. And we can easily solve this uh, equation for negative value of the tension uh, in this form. So this is e to the two phi, uh, basically L square over W square with some normalization. And this is defined, basically that's how we define phi, that is basically L square over this embedding function F square. So in particular, if you set t equals to zero, that's nothing but the hyperbolic plane. And this is our original path integral optimization. But for non-zero t, you get like some kind of suboptimal family of the tensor networks uh, from this construction. But the, the important point is that all these metrics are hyperbolic again, in the same way, uh, the same way as in the CFT. And, and in basically a cartoon for this is that these are the optimal geometries. So this is our region M here between sigma and Q. And depending on the value of parameter T, the surfaces Q run from the boundary for a particular value of T all the way up to the time slice T equals to zero. So when I was arguing for you that the, the, the path integral optimization metrics from CFT are basically time slices of ADS, this is precise. This is making the statement precise. If we think about the dual of them, namely this hard to Hawking wave functions, they are maximal when we evaluate them from the boundary all the way up to the time slice. And then the metric on the time slice is the same as the one from path integral optimization. Maybe a comment is that the tension parameter here basically parameterizes this angle between sigma and Q by this way. And moreover, when we evaluate the gravity and the Hayward term, uh, sorry, with gravity action with the Hayward term and we minimize it over T, this is our, in some sense, our, what I was calling the complexity from the hartle hawking wave function. We can check that uh, this is minimal for T equals to zero. So indeed this holographic path integral complexity indeed is minimized for the value of the tension parameter T equals to zero. Okay, good. So we can we can actually general because this computation on general in gravity is very universal, and it has like very minimal uh, assumptions about you know technical steps that you need to use. So basically, you can evaluate it in all excited states, in higher dimensions, in black holes, in JT gravity, 
as well in, in Lorentzian geometries. And this is what we did in this work with Yan and Dongsheng and Tadashi. So in particular, if we evaluate it in some excited states of ADS3, these are these conical singularities or BTZ geometries, again, we get equations of motion from this uh, maximization of Hartle wave Hawking wave functions as, as basically the constant mean curvature, k equals two to t. And then the slices that we are talking about now interpolate between this boundary slice here, all the way up to the slice at t equals to zero. And this actually slice at t equals to zero, or value of t equals to zero is nothing but the same solution as I was showing you before from the past integral optimization. So this is this inverse the cosine square from the, from the path integral optimization for thermophil double or, or black hole. But then the relation of course is that uh, this W, this conformal time in gravity is the same as the Euclidean time tau that we were using in, to parameterize the solution from the path integral optimization. So that's important. Okay, are there any questions about the examples? I'm if not then. I'm... Not really, you proceed. Okay, great. So let me maybe just discuss one more thing. Uh, you may have a question, how come, um, basically how come uh, in, we are, we are claiming that these two things are somehow dual to each other. How come from the field theory path, uh, path integral optimization, we got the constraint from the Liouville action that the Ricci scalar should be constant negative. Whereas on the gravity side, we are getting from the maximization of hartle hawking wave function that uh, the Neumann boundary condition should be imposed. How come, how come these two approaches give you the same metrics? Maybe if this is not obvious, uh, let me just explain how this works. Basically, uh, this comes through the wheeler defeat equation, or in other words, uh, sorry, from the Hamiltonian constraint in gravity, everything I'm talking about here is, is semi-classical. And, uh, and basically one way to see it is that, um, I, as I told you, we are computing hartle hawking wave function in the, uh, in the on-shell solution. So that means that if I take any surface Q, co-dimension one surface Q in the, in, the, in the solution of Einstein's equation, we can basically take the normal uh, vector to the surface Q it is this is true before the optimization okay uh, any normal vector to the surface q and if i dot this so this einstein's equation so as i told you we are we are on shell so einstein's equation is always solved and it's always satisfied and if we dot this um, einstein's equations with the n mu and mu this is nothing but the Hamiltonian constraint so on any co-dimensional one surface on this, of this classical solution, the Hamiltonian constraint is satisfied. On the other hand, I was arguing for you that this maximization of hartle hawking wave function is equivalent to imposing the Neumann boundary condition. If you impose the Neumann boundary condition, which was basically this thing here, it's a very simple exercise to show that if this is true, then uh, this combination k square minus kij kij on the Neumann boundary condition, this is given by d d minus one t square. It's a simple exercise, but that means if the if the Hamiltonian constraint is always satisfied, if I impose this Neumann boundary condition, that means that the left hand side of the Hamiltonian constraint is also constant, and that means in particular that the Ricci scalar of this induced uh, metric on which I am talking about sorry, on Q in my particular case, has to be constant. So in other words, at the slices that we consider from this maximization of hard to hooking wave function, they, they satisfy this constraint that the, the Ricci scalar of this hard to hooking wave function slices should be proportional to the norm as to the cosmological constant times this one minus T square over D minus one square. On the other hand, the equation from path integral optimization, which was the general Liouville uh, equation, uh, or, or you know, this generalized from this generalized action in higher dimensions, this was the equation in higher dimension. They are equivalent if basically this this uh, mu that was related to one over the UV cutoff, or the, the this this poten this constant pot uh, of the in front of the potential of this generalized Liouville action is related to the tension. 
And that's precisely gives us the dictionary between this unoptimized tensor networks in some sense, uh, given by uh, uh, arbitrary value of T uh, between certain, in a certain range uh, that is smaller than zero and the value of mu. So in particular, the optimal geometries that we studied with Tadashi and Nila in Masamichi in Kento, they corresponded to choice mu equals to one, which is basically t equals to zero. That's what I that's what I was talking about before, as you know, this t equals to zero being optimal. But now in this story from gravity and now from the path integral optimization, we can generalize it such that we include suboptimal tensor networks for for maybe smaller values of. Okay, and finally, as Shandan was asking, actually this gravity uh, perspective is very general uh, and very universal. So we may as well just evaluate it for ADS or DS space times. Uh, basically, we just compute hard to Hawking wave function between some boundary. So in ADS, the boundary is a time like sigma, whereas in DS, the boundary is space like sigma. But again, we can take this region between sigma and some surface space like or time like Q in here and also in here and then evaluate hard to Hawking wave function and maximize it with respect to the choice of the metric on Q. And there the story is very interesting. Like we can have slices that are actually positively as well as negatively curved, depending on, um, on basically whether the metric is in ADS, whether the Q is in ADS or DS and whether it's time-like or space-like. You can see all the details in our, in our paper. And, but actually this analysis motivated us to generalize our path integral optimization in CFT into the Lorentzian setup. And in the Lorentzian setup, one naturally computes not wave functions, but transition amplitudes. So let's say we consider some values of the, of the field at some T initial, and then we want to compute uh, the probability amplitude or overlap between that and some other value of the field at some T final. If we take the ratio again of this transition amplitude computed in some value rescaling times the uh, Lorentzian over just Lorentzian eta metric, then we can check again by these arguments of heat kernel that I was showing to you at the very beginning of the talk that we get the Lorentzian uvil action, for example, in ADS. So again, in some sense, we can do the path integral complexity and path integral optimization in Lorentzian signature as basically optimizing this phase that appears in, from, the, from the partition function or from this, uh, from this ratio. And then we can uh, you know, interpret now this Lorentzian level action as some kind of uh, Lorentzian path integral complexity. And we have done some preliminary works on that and arguments we're still developing this at the moment, but that's somehow a, a nice progress towards Lorentzian geometries in ADS and DS. Okay. Uh, maybe there's some other story with the time from tensor networks, but I will not have time to talk about. I, I think that would that would be maybe too much information for this talk. So uh, I think it's a good time to conclude. Uh, so in this talk, I wanted to give maybe a general and big picture of uh, of path integral optimization from CFT to ADS. And I was trying to argue that this path integral optimization is a useful and interesting tool to extract geometry from CFT states in arbitrary dimensions. Uh, on the other hand, as the path integral complexity is very universal in a sense that it just depends on, on the geometry on which we prepare, prepare the state and the central charge. So in some sense, it's as universal as entanglement entropy that is just C, the, the, has the form C over three log of say L over epsilon, and you can apply it to holography as well as to free theories. It will always have the same form. So that makes it very advantageous. We are not limited to free theories and some uh, only Gaussian setups. We can really do it for arbitrary interacting holographic CFTs. On the second part, the second part of my talk, I was talking about gravity uh, and gravity dual of this path integral optimization. And I was trying to argue that actually we can naturally think, naturally think about this procedure in terms of hartle hawking wave functions, semi-classically computed in ADS, as well as Lorentzian ADS and DS. And from that procedure, uh, this path integral geometries correspond to the constant mean curvature slices of ADS spacetimes. So this is somehow an interesting twist on the bulk side, but it's equivalent to imposing 
the Ricci uh, negative curvature on the skew slice, say Euclidean geometry. So it's very consistent with the path integral optimization from CFT. And I, as I was trying to argue, this gravity somehow gives you the correct procedure. So it tells you what should be the UV procedure, but dressed with all the finite cut of corrections. And in some sense, to understand better this finite cut of corrections, one may use different uh, approaches to finite cut of holography. In particular, this in this work with Onkar Parikar and Yorit Krutov, we managed to show that using TT bar, one can actually construct some kind of holographic tensor networks, or uh, uh, as simply uh, basically geometries of AD, of constant mean curvature slices, exactly the same ones that we had here. Uh, basically, this one's in Euclidean signature, and we precisely constructed the um, uh, the TT bar, the time-dependent TT bar deformation that gives you know, that corresponds that prepares that, that prepares for you this particular state in TT bar deformed CFTs. If you want to hear more about this, you can actually uh, join the talk of Onkar uh, in our joint seminar between Warsaw, my group in Warsaw, and the group. Uh, in Potsdam this Wednesday, Onkar will be precisely talking about this work. Uh, I didn't have much time to talk about tension as time from tensor network, but this is also an interesting part of our paper that you can read at the last section of this recent work with Ian Dongchen and Tadashi. And there's still a lot to do, namely the better understanding of Lorentzian geometries and this Lorentzian path integral complexity would be very interesting. And also the story in the sitter. Uh, seems like you can easily compute it from hard to Hawking wave, per wave perspective, but hopefully it will push us to understand more DSCFT correspondence and so on. Okay, so thank you very much for giving me so much time and uh, also for your really excellent questions. And this is all I wanted to say today. Thank and you. Thanks a lot. For uh, your nice talk, uh, I would suggest all the attendees, please unmute yourself and give a clap for uh, Powell for giving such a nice talk, first of all. And I can understand like after giving such a long talk, he will be very uh, like uh, feeling, <laughs> I can understand. But uh, yeah, like if you have any particular question, very specific, please ask. I don't have any problem. Maybe anybody can ask, like Obishek or Nilesh, those who are my students, can you please ask one, at least one question or I just stop? Maybe I can ask something. Hi, Pavel. Oh, uh, hi. <laughs> Long time no see. Yeah. Um, do you have some comments about the uh, uh, relation of your uh, new holographic perspective of uh, integral optimization and the uh, um, the old CV, well, all the, the most acknowledged the, um, holographic proposal of CV and CA. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's actually a good question. So, basically, when we when we uh, evaluated this, uh, so basically in the CV, let's say CA. Um, a CA maybe is closer, closer related to our Lorentzian pers perspective. So I, we're still trying to understand it better. I don't have a definite statement on the relation to Willer, David, and CA. But at least for CV, I can say something. Mm -hmm. So in CV, we would be really taking some slice like this, this t equals to zero, this extremal volume slice, and then computing the only the volume of that guy. Okay. In our prescription, actually, we we not only evaluate that. But we, we evaluate the gravity action all the way up from sigma up to this slice. Okay. So it's not like we only care about the intrinsic geometry of that slice in some sense. We really, we really evaluate the whole gravity action. But actually, uh, 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 when we, uh, in our evaluation of this action, we notice that we have similar terms, like we have when, when we compared our action from this complexity with the answers from the CV, a module of this term that comes from this divergent pieces in sigma, actually we were getting very similar answers as the CV, but they were not exactly equal. So we, I, I, I suspect that our, our answer or basically evaluating the action up to the surface Q and then optimizing over T will give you 
will give you CV as a part of it, but it will also give you some other contributions that, that in particular, for example, in our case, in the CV, you don't need to care about the Hayward term, right? Yeah. Whereas in our case, you really have to care, care about the Hayward because you know this term is non-singular if you're interested in the geometry of M from the boundary up to T. So, um, so yeah, I don't, I don't to be to be honest, like I, I see that there is like resemblance of the answer is pretty strong that you know there there are some contributions of like CV in our answers for complexity, but it's not exactly the same. But it would be interesting to see what is exactly the relation if we should if maybe some difference of our actions would give you CV or something like that. I think that's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe it is also it is more related to the to the Lorentzian part also for CV because here you you obtain like the t equal zero slice which is something that is not really um, uh, if you think about the 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 the, the, uh, the wormhole behind the horizon and you you necessarily have to introduce some time dependence so maybe in the Euclidean part uh, of uh, the talk you 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 don't really uh, uh, you can't really um, uh, say much about yeah the you're probably like yeah, the, so. the sharp distinction can you need maybe more complicated metrics i agree yeah and uh, uh, i have uh, maybe a, a second question uh, it is more technical uh if you um, do, do you have you tried to do something about uh, uh, rotating uh, geometries actually yes uh, so in the appendix of our longer paper uh, we have looked at this neumann boundary condition for spinning btz mm -hmm. and we can solve it we can find the surface and so on um, we have actually not studied so much in the past uh, the past integral optimization for the spinning BTZ, so that might be interesting. But at least the gravity, at least in ADS three, the gravity for spinning BTZ is is we have written it in the appendix. So so there is a particular explicit construction. We have not. Yeah, I'm, we have I was... evaluated the action uh, explicitly and verified this complexity, but I think that might be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I was a, a little bit puzzled about uh, uh, the, the 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 solution uh, you found because, uh, uh, for instance, uh, if you uh, well, if you take uh, um, the tensionless uh, limit of that solution, uh, it seems that uh, the, the 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 conformal factor, let's say, does not depend on uh, on on the chemical potential. And so this is, this was a little bit puzzling for me. Uh, uh, okay, okay. You, uh, yeah, I have not. Uh, yeah, that's why actually, we, yeah, that's that's a good. That's exactly my point. That somehow we have not studied this. Uh, uh, I, we have not studied this path integral optimization in CFT. So I I was not so that's why I was not sure if you know taking t equals to zero would be the same as the. Mm -hmm. as to basically reproducing the CFT answer, but I should look at it maybe, you know, now that you pointed, I, 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 we have not really studied that so carefully. Basically, the way we wrote the solution is we, we wrote it as an example of some maps in ADS, because that's yeah. also how you can con construct various queues. So if you naively uh, apply these maps, you can see that in the spinning BTZ, the surface is a solution of the Neumann boundary condition. But I, 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 I had it, you know, I. In fact, I told it to my student as some future project, but he was busy writing master thesis, so I don't think he uh, he had time to do much progress on that. But I think it's very interesting to work out the spinning BTZ case. Yeah, we with the, with Alice and Federico we were discussing about it, but uh, uh, we uh, we never really uh, proceeded uh, uh, with. Uh, uh, I see. I see. With, with the full answer, yeah. So. Uh, I see. Okay, then I should I should uh, revisit that. Maybe we should we should discuss what what, what is interesting there. Okay. I remember that it was very interesting setup, but we have not really. Uh, there were other things that we still wanted to understand. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks for sir. your great.
So uh, thank you, Powell, for your nice talk. It will be posted in my channel, YouTube. I will share the link with you, uh, up, uploading it and uh, hope to see you again with some new idea, new uh, talk. And uh, most importantly, stay safe and healthy. That's important. Yeah. And, the same uh, for you. And uh, thanks a lot for all these great questions and this uh, all this time. I hope it's going to be useful for some people. It's it's a bit tiring, but I think it's a great amount of time for, <laughs> for explaining some details. So. And thank you all the participants for asking questions and comments. And like your participation is really important. It will be posted in YouTube. You can look in QASTM seminar. You will see the previous 84 talks along with this talk. So this is the 85th one. And the next talk, I just, I usually mention, but always I forgot. Uh, uh, like, uh, uh. Yeah, the next talk will be given by, I don't know, I haven't posted or I don't know. It will be given by Professor Jeff Morgan from University of Cape Town. And he will talking about uh, John Simon's matter theories, dualities and all. Even Powell, you can also join. The link will be same, time will be same, but the date will be on Thursday, okay? So, yeah, everybody is welcome. Thank you and stay safe. Okay. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye.